So uh, I'll start the lecture. Uh, in the last uh, talk, I explained there are seven crystal classes uh, written over here, cubic, hexagonal, and so on, uh, defined by the uh, lattice parameters and also the angles between the uh, axes. And this part of it is important in the sense that the defining symmetry of a particular crystal class is stated. So for example, a cube, you would necessarily need to be able to find four triads in order for that to be a cube. And within each crystal class, we have uh, a number of uh, unit cells possible. And therefore, we generate a series of 14 different Bravais lattices. Okay? Um, in the cubic, we have our body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, uh, sorry, this is primitive cubic, face-centered cubic, and body-centered cubic, and we use the symbols P, F, and I. And I explained to you that we are not going to use three-dimensional diagrams as far as is possible. Instead, we use structure projections, where whenever we state coordinates, they refer to the height, Z, and when the coordinates are not stated, you assume that there is uh, a point at 0 and at 1. Now, these are the two crystal structures of iron. Uh, we have the body-centered cubic form here, and we have the face-centered cubic. Uh, I haven't drawn the face-centering atoms there, there, and there, just to avoid confusion. Uh, this is ferrite, and this is austenite. Is there any other crystalline form of iron? Sorry? Hexagonal close packed, right? So this is the phase diagram for pure iron, where we are plotting temperature versus pressure. And this is ferrite, which is stable at low temperatures and uh, low pressures and also at very high temperatures and high pressures. So we have delta iron here and alpha iron here, uh, alpha ferrite and delta ferrite. Now, after alpha, you have beta, but nowhere on this diagram can I see beta. Why is that? Sorry? Uh, yes, so in the old days, people used to think that when we quench a steel, uh, you preserve beta iron, which is the hard form of iron. Yeah, so people didn't know about martensite. They thought that the transition at about 760 degrees centigrade, which is the Curie temperature, is actually what we get when we cool rapidly, and they called it beta iron. So once you realize that there is a Curie temperature, uh, 760 degrees C, it's no longer a different crystalline form. So beta iron has gone out of use. But beta, uh, but iron, uh, alpha iron, which is ferromagnetic, will have the magnetic spins aligned, right? Along one set of axes. So that's no longer cubic. Yeah? Cubic means you have cubic symmetry, and the spins would be pointing in all directions. But if it's ferromagnetic, then the spins are all aligned. So it's no longer cubic. So the old idea of beta iron was correct in one sense, that as soon as you go below the Curie temperature, the lattice is no longer cubic. Everyone assumes it's cubic, right? When you do your X-ray analysis or EBSD, you set the lattice parameter of ferrite to be a constant value irrespective of A1, A2, A3, and you assume it's cubic. Now, the amount of tetragonality is actually very small. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 5. The difference between the two uh, the, uh, axes is very small, but it's not cubic. It's only above 760 degrees centigrade that alpha iron becomes cubic because the spins are aligned randomly it's no longer ferromagnetic. Now, even though the tetragonality of alpha iron at room temperature is very small, it has an influence 
because when you are making a transformer, you know, you get expansion and contraction and magnetostriction. Yeah, you've heard of magnetostriction. When you apply a field, you know, the length changes in a polycrystalline piece of iron. That's a consequence of the alignment of spins and the non-cubic symmetry of the iron. So alpha iron actually below 6 degree, 760 degrees centigrade is slightly tetragonal. Above it, it becomes cubic. This is uh, austenite, which is face-centered cubic. And is austenite, ma the, what are the magnetic properties of austenite? Say, say it louder, louder, I can't hear. I'm an old person, yeah? So paramagnetic, that means if you put a magnet next to it, it won't be attracted, right? Yeah? But even that is not strictly correct. So supposing that I plot the length versus temperature, okay? So this is length. So we are doing an experiment in a dilatometer. And if my material is fully austenitic, then I will get a line because of thermal expansion. Now, ferrite has a lower density than austenite, right? So for the same number of atoms, my length for ferrite will be greater. Okay. But its expansion coefficient will be smaller. Okay. So this is alpha and has a smaller expansion coefficient. Now this has a major consequence on properties because you do not use austenitic steels in power stations. The large thermal expansion coefficient leads to thermal fatigue when the temperature cycles. Okay. That's why the steels have to be ferritic. But the reason why this has a larger thermal expansion coefficient is because there are actually two forms of austenite, one with a low density and one with a high density. Okay. So if I draw the two forms of austenite, and the slope here is the same as the slope here and the slope here, okay? So this is gamma 1 and gamma 2. One of them has a high density and the other one has a low density. And the fraction of gamma 1 and gamma 2 changes with temperature. And that is why we get a larger expansion coefficient for austenite than ferrite. One of those forms of austenite is ferromagnetic and the other one is antiferromagnetic. Okay? So gamma 1 and gamma 2 are ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. So I can pick up the Neal temperature, which is the temperature below which a material becomes uh, uh, antiferromagnetic by cooling the austenite to a temperature as low as 80 kelvins. Now, how can I make pure iron cool to a temperature which is 80 kelvin? So we're talking about pure iron, right? Pure iron should transform into ferrite at 910 degrees centigrade. How can I make it stay austenite at room temperature? Any ideas? Now, supposing I take a piece of copper, which is face-centered cubic, and I introduce iron into it so that you form an iron precipitate. <coughs> if the precipitate is small, then it is constrained to remain in the face-centered cubic structure because it's surrounded by face-centered cubic material. Similarly, if you put a piece of iron inside, uh, sorry, if you put a piece of copper inside iron, Initially, when it forms, it's body-centered cubic copper. 
not face centered cubic copper. Okay, it's only when it grows that it changes into face centered cubic copper. So by putting pure iron inside a copper matrix, you force it to remain austenitic, and then we can pick up that it's antiferromagnetic below 80 Kelvin. Okay. I can attract austenite with a magnet. In other words, ferromagnetism. The way I would do it is I would add quite a lot of nickel to the material, and that retains the ferromagnetic state of austenite. So austenite is not always uh, indifferent to the presence of a magnet. It can be ferromagnetic, it can be antiferromagnetic. Right, now epsilon iron uh, is hexagonal closed packed iron. And it has the highest density of all the forms of iron. Um, it makes sense, therefore, that if you apply a lot of pressure, then you stabilize hexagonal form because it has the lowest density. You know, the system tries to adjust to the pressure by reducing the volume. Right? So where, where can I find epsilon iron, pure epsilon iron, in very large quantity? So I'm not talking about iron manganese alloys. Where can I find pure epsilon iron in very large quantities? Yeah, so strictly speaking, it's not pure, but it could be pure because the pressure at the center of the Earth is enormous. And even though the temperature is high, you know, something like 6,000 Kelvin, we have solid iron in the middle of the Earth. And that solid iron has the hexagonal closed back structure. Now, there is some argument about this, yeah? whether it's hexagonal or double, uh, double hexagonal close back. So hexagonal close back, you know, the stacking sequence of the close back layers is A, B, A, B, A, B, right? We will do that later. You can also have a double hexagonal close back, which is called A, B, B, uh, A, B, uh, C, B, A, B, C, B, and so on. Uh, and how do we know what forms of iron might exist in the center? Well, uh, you can do experiments. If you have an earthquake that will send waves through the core and you pick up the longitudinal and shear waves on the other side and you look at how they behave and therefore you can determine whether that's consistent with calculations of what should exist in the middle of the earth. So right in the middle we have a solid core and above that is a liquid iron nickel alloy. Right, now this is the periodic table, and I just returned from Russia, where I, I saw uh, the person who, uh, I saw the picture of the person who originally invented the periodic table. Do you know who that is? Mendeleev, yeah? Uh, if you look at this vertical column, then we have below iron, we have ruthenium and osmium. And these are called the iron analogues, yeah? because the outer shell of those elements is the same as that of iron. So chemically, they behave very similarly to iron. But this iron is body-centered cubic. Uh, these are hexagonal closed packed. Okay? And this is also an iron analog, but it exists in such small quantities that we don't really know what crystal structure it is but a good guess would be that it's hexagonal close packed. Okay. Now, supposing that we had hexagonal close packed iron stable at room temperature and pressure, I would say we would not have civilization. Why is that? What is the problem with hexagonal closed backed structures? Yeah, exactly. So the easiest slip systems are on the basal plane. 
and there are only three. Okay? But you have three, so why, why is that a problem? Hmm? Uh, yeah, uh, but um, supposing we were restricted to just three slip systems, that means a close back, close back directions, why is that a problem? Hmm? Yeah, but all crystals are anisotropic. Yeah. So, have you heard that you need five independent slip systems for a material to be ductile? Do you know that? So, let me, let me show you why. So supposing that you have a polycrystalline sample, and you deform it, and let's assume that this is the grain that starts deforming first, and slip causes it to change its shape into that. So basically, if this crystal cannot match this deformation, then you will have a hole created. Yeah. So this crystal has to be able to slip so that it exactly reproduces that shape, right? And you need five independent slip systems in order to produce an arbitrary change in shape. Because if you look at a strain tensor, This, uh, this here is equal to that, and this is equal to that, and uh, this is equal to that, so we don't need to worry about that yet. So we've got, um, we've got six components in there, right? But if I add epsilon 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3, then for slip, that's zero, because that gives us the volume change. So there are only five independent components in there. I haven't given any values to those parameters. That means it represents an arbitrary change in shape. So produce a completely arbitrary change in shape, you need five independent slip systems. Okay? Hexagonal system does not have that unless you bring in additional modes such as twinning and so forth, which introduces other complications. Okay? So if iron was not body-centered cubic at room temperature, we would be in trouble, right? And why is it body-centered cubic, whereas ruthenium, osmium are, are not? Well, if you do some first principles calculations, that means calculations using electron theory, and they're done at uh, zero Kelvin, and this is the cohesive energy, that means the energy that holds, uh, effectively, the reduction in energy when atoms come together in a particular pattern and this is the volume of the cell and obviously the system will try to adopt the minimum volume, uh, minimum energy. Okay? When you do first principles calculation ignoring magnetism, it is actually hexagonal close packed iron which is much more stable than body centered or face centered cubic iron. It's only magnetism which stabilizes the body-centered cubic form. So without the magnetic properties, body-centered cubic iron would not be stable at ambient conditions. So we have magnetism to thank for civilization as we know it. Yeah? You should tell your friends about this, you know, in other subjects. Okay, so uh, just to summarize what we've done so far, we've dealt with uh, amorphous materials, uh, uh, or at least the structure of amorphous materials, and emphasized that it's isotropic because the atoms are distributed at random. Uh, crystals, on the other hand, have long-range order, and therefore they are necessarily anisotropic. Uh, and, of course, crystals can be solid or liquid. We have liquid crystals in the displays that we use uh, in your computers and so forth. Uh, 
We haven't really dealt with polycrystals as yet. Uh, we've discussed uh, lattice and lattice points, unit cells and space filling requirements, uh, primitive cell and lattice vectors, the 14 different kinds of Brave lattices and how to refer to directions and planes. Directions are vectors in real space and planes are uh, also vectors. The plane normals are vectors, but their components are referred to reciprocal space, and I'll explain that in a later lecture. So we are now going to continue on this theme and actually start putting atoms onto our imaginary lattice. Okay? So this, for example, is a primitive uh, unit cell, a cubic unit cell. And I'm going to put a pair of atoms, a blue atom at 0, 0, 0, and a red atom at a half, half, half in the body-centered position. Okay? So if I put this pair of atoms at one lattice point, I've got to put them at every lattice point because every lattice point has the same environment. So here. So that is the structure, a uh, crystal structure now. It's not just a lattice. We've actually got physical atoms over there. What is the lattice type here? Sorry? Mm -mm -mm. In order to be BCC, this point should have the same environment as this, and it doesn't. Yeah? Because look, this is surrounded by blue atoms, this is surrounded by uh, red atoms. Yeah? Uh, yeah. It is, it is, the lattice type is primitive cubic, and there is a motif. We call it a motif, the pattern that we put at each lattice point of a blue atom at 0, 0, 0 and a red atom at a half, a half, half. So the way we describe it is that the crystal structure is equal to the lattice plus motif, where the lattice in this case is cubic P and the motif is uh, a blue atom at 0, 0, 0, and a red atom at a half, half, half. So that motif is placed at every single lattice point to generate the crystal structure. And, and you're right, you know, uh, if you make the blue atom sodium and the red atom chloride, then that's your sodium chloride structure. Actually, this is more like uh, brass. Uh, sodium chloride, I think, is FCC. Okay? Uh, so it's a copper atom here. If it's a 50 50 mixture of copper and zinc, that's a copper atom and a zinc atom. Or you can reverse it, doesn't matter. Everyone happy with that? Oh uh, yeah, here we are, the structure of uh, brass. Okay, and in this case it's simple. We can throw a draw a three-dimensional diagram, but as I go on in the lecture, you'll see that that becomes tricky. Okay, right. So uh, the basic principle of generating a crystal structure is you identify a lattice type, which is very simple. It's one of the fourteen possibilities, and then you identify the motif that you place exactly in the same orientation at every single lattice point. Okay. So, if I, if I look at this, how many lattice points are there in this unit cell? Just one, because it's primitive, right? And how many atoms in the unit cell? Two, because the motif has two, right? Okay, uh, this is now uh, the uh, projection of the face-centered cubic cell, right? And we are going to generate the structure of diamond, carbon diamond, yeah? By placing a carbon atom at zero, 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 
and at a quarter, quarter, quarter at each one of those lattice points. So, for example, I'd place a carbon atom here at zero, 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 and one at a quarter, quarter, quarter. I'd place a carbon atom at this position and another one here at what height? Three quarters, because we are starting from half, right? How many uh, lattice points do we have? Four. Yeah, so we have the corner contributing one, and then there are the lattice points at the face centers, which are shared between two cubes. So there are six faces divided by two. That gives us three plus one is four. Okay, so I'm placing a motif of identical atoms at zero, 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 and a quarter, quarter, quarter. And now I've got to do this for every single lattice point. So here's the corresponding one where the second one comes at the height three quarters because this one is at a height half. Yeah? And we continue that process. And that gives us the structure of diamond. Right. So if you just focus on, on this part, that's the crystal structure of diamond. How many carbon atoms in there? Eight. Eight, because there are four lattice points in the cell, and we've got two atoms per lattice point, so there are eight carbon atoms in there. Now, if I try to draw this in three dimensions, you can see that that's uh, not really, it's going to take you half a day to draw this properly without a computer, right? But uh, if you look, these are, these are tetrahedral bonds here, okay? And you can, you can see those tetrahedral bonds even in this, because if I look at this one, which is at zero, then these two are pointing upwards. And three quarters is the same as minus a quarter. So these bonds are pointing downwards. Okay, so that's a tetrahedron. Okay, so um, that's the structure of diamond again. And sometimes, in order to look at symmetry, it's good to draw four unit cells next to each other. Okay, because you can see what's going on in the surroundings of the atoms. Right, this is the same as the diamond structure, except that we no longer have identical atoms in the motif. So this is the zinc sulfide, uh, the face centered cubic uh, unit cell zinc sulfide structure where we put a zinc atom at zero, 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 and a sulfur atom at a quarter, quarter, quarter. So the only thing that's different now is that we've replaced one of the carbon atoms, by, uh, one of the atoms by sulfur and the other one by zinc. Okay. So the basic unit cell is still the same. And it's a really simple description. You know, you've got the unit cell and you've got the motif and therefore the whole thing is defined. three dimensions. Okay. Now, um, the, I don't know if you ride bicycles. Yeah, do you ride bicycles? None of you, huh? You come by car or what? Yeah, you should ride bicycles. You know, recently, uh, my group in Cambridge, we cycled from Oxford to Cambridge, which is 145 kilometers. So you should try this one day. And we did it in uh, nine hours, so that's not very fast, but we enjoyed it, <laughs> okay? Um, right, so this, uh, the reason why I refer to bicycles is the light-emitting diodes. They are based on gallium nitride, gallium arsenide type structures. And this is the structure of gallium nitride, which again, you know, we have uh, a similar structure to diamond. Um, but with gallium atoms and nitrogen atoms. Okay. Now, even more complicated, uh, I, as I told you last time, I was in Russia, and I took photographs of uh, minerals. And this is a mineral called fluorite, which you can see the cubic shape, actually. The equilibrium shape is cubic. 
So it's a cubic, cubic lattice, again a face-centered cubic lattice, but now uh, there's a motif of three atoms because the formula is calcium fluoride, CaF2. Yeah? So CaF2. So we have a calcium atom at 0, 0, 0 and two fluorine atoms, one at a height quarter and another one at a height three quarters, placed at every single lattice point. And that gives you the structure of calcium fluoride. Whoops. Okay. In three dimensions, it's messy. But you can, you can see, you can see uh, the fluorine atoms at a quarter and three quarters. And how many fluorine atoms do we have in the cell? Hmm? Yeah, uh, eight, eight. Yeah, because if I go back to the structure projection, these are completely inside the cell. Yeah. So there are four lattice points, and the motif is a one calcium atom and two fluorine atoms. Uh, so these are whoops. These are completely inside that cell. So we've got eight fluorine atoms, and then we have the calcium atoms, four, four of them. Okay. So. Even though this is complicated, you know, we've got uh, 12 atoms in the cell, it's very easy to reproduce by thinking that it's a cubic F cell and that there is a motif of a calcium atom at 0, 0, 0 and then two fluorine atoms at a quarter and three quarters. This is a, a mixture of nickel and aluminium atoms, okay? And uh, there's a particular ratio of nickel to aluminum atoms. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side, um, uh, or your left-hand side, no, your right-hand side, yeah? Uh, can you tell me how many aluminum atoms and how many nickel atoms there are in the cell? So the aluminum is blue. How many aluminum atoms? One. And the nickel atoms are at the face centers, three. So what do you think is the formula for this compound? Ni3Al, right? And does that ring any bells? Where do you find Ni3Al? Which uh, alloy? Yeah. Any ideas? Yeah, take a guess, don't worry. Take a guess. Where? It's very, very important compound. Every time you fly, you rely on that. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but which component? Turn blades. Yeah, the nickel-based superalloys have 70% of this ordered compound. Okay. Uh, and what is the crystal? Uh, what is the lattice type? This, uh, this one at the face center doesn't have the same environment as this one. So what is it? It's primitive cubic, all right? Now, if I disorder the atoms, that means I allow them to be randomly distributed on the lattice, then you effectively have an average atom because we don't know whether this is nickel or aluminum. And what is the lattice type here? Yeah, because now we can't distinguish. Between, uh, we, uh, all, all these environments are the same. So if you disorder this, we get cubic F. This is cubic P. And all we've done is change the order of the atoms, right? So the lattice parameters are very close to each other. So these two kinds of structures fit very well together. 
and they are in a cube-cube orientation relationship. That means the edges of the cubes are parallel. Now that's very important because that reduces the interface energy between the compound and the disordered phase. Now why is it important to have a low interfacial energy when you're operating at high temperatures? Say you design your precipitates to produce strength, okay? If you're operating at 1400 degrees centigrade, why is it important to have a very low interfacial energy? So is anybody working on precipitation here? In steels? What kind of precipitate? Okay, let's forget about precipitate. Supposing you have grains. What happens to the grains at high temperatures? The grain size increases, right? The structure coarsens. And that coarsening process is driven only by minimization of the total interfacial area, right? Now, if you make a strong material for high temperatures, then reducing the interface energy reduces the coarsening rate. And this system is perfect for that. Okay. So this was discovered uh, maybe 1950 uh, in Britain, okay, where you try and match the precipitate with the matrix with a very low interfacial energy because they're both cubic, their lattice parameters are not very different, and they meet edge to edge because it's just a, an ordering reaction. The actual system is more complicated. It's not just Ni3Al, but there will be Ni3Al, Ti, and so on because uh, there are many parameters you have to satisfy in order to design a good alloy, not just coarsening. Yeah. So all of the world's aircraft engines completely rely on this. This operates at really high temperatures, and yet it has a very stable distribution of precipitates. Now, there is a, another consequence of uh, the fact that this is cubic P and this is cubic F, right? If I uh, look at the structure projection of cubic F, come on. Okay, so cubic F is, is here. If I'm diffracting X-rays from this layer and this layer, I will not get any intensity because there's a layer in the middle which will scatter X-rays at half a wavelength out of phase. So I will not pick up a 0, 0, 1 reflection with cubic F. I will only pick up 0, 0, 002, planes half the spacing of 0, 0, 001. If I look at cubic P, there's nothing in the middle. So I actually get a 0, 0, 1 reflection. So with this uh, ordered phase, when I do electron diffraction or X-ray diffraction or neutron diffraction, I will get intensity corresponding to the 1, 0, 0 reflections for the order phase, but not for the disordered phase. Okay, okay uh, going back now to um, the elements of symmetry, we looked at rotation axis, and a dyad is a twofold axis of rotation, that means I if I rotate by 180 degrees, I recover the structure. Okay. Triad involves a rotation of 120 degrees. 
So every 120 degrees rotation, I recover the structure. A tetrad is a rotation of 90 degrees about each uh, in order to recover the structure. And hexad is a six-fold rotation. And we looked at um, adding translations so that uh, a rotation axis becomes a screw axis. So there's a rotation and a translation. And a glide plane uh, involves reflection followed by translation by a fraction of the repeat distance along here. OK, so I'm going to introduce you to point groups. So point groups are combinations of symmetry elements which pass through a single point of whatever object that you are examining. So they all pass through a point. So point groups cannot involve any translation because they all pass through a single point. Yeah. And this is a molecule of water. And there is an axis of rotation here, which is a twofold axis of rotation, because if I turn this through 180 degrees, I obtain the same object, right? Plus, there is a mirror plane here, which, is, which contains this rotation axis. So they pass through this point here. And we say the point group of this molecule is 2m. That means a twofold axis with a mirror plane parallel to that axis. Now, notice that this molecule is not straight. H2O is not a straight molecule. And I mentioned to you that without body-centered cubic iron, we would not have civilization. If this molecule was straight, we would be freezing. Yeah. Because water would be less dense than ice. So the ice would then sink, and you would build up, and you would freeze the oceans basically. So that's another story to tell to your friends who don't do metallurgy. Yeah? That you owe your existence to a bent molecule of water. Right. Now the importance of this is if you did some spectroscopy, there will be certain vibration modes for this molecule. Okay. So these are the vibration modes. Uh, you know, you've got this kind of bending and stretching. And each one of these vibration modes will have a certain frequency, and you pick up lines on a spectrum. So if you want to find whether there's water on Jupiter, you know, you look for the spectral lines corresponding to water. Or if you want to do an experiment on Earth, the same thing applies, OK? But the important thing is that every molecule which has a point group symmetry 2m will also have those vibration modes. Okay? So, uh, of course, they will happen at different frequencies because the masses of atoms might be different. But you should get at least those frequencies, uh, or at least those modes of vibration that water has. So, for example, sulfur tetrafluoride, okay? water and sulfur tetrafluoride have the same point group symmetry, and therefore they will have the same vibration modes. There might be additional modes, but this is sulfur tetrafluoride. So can you see that there's a twofold axis going that way, vertically up? And there's a mirror plane passing containing these three atoms. Yeah. So this has the same point group symmetry. So we should pick up the same vibration modes for this molecule as well. Okay. There, it will happen at different frequencies because the masses of the atoms are different. And there may be additional vibration modes because this is a more complex molecule than water. Okay. So in chemistry, point group symmetries are used exactly to look at vibration modes of molecules. Is everyone happy with that? Now this is a crystal of uh, gypsum. And its equilibrium shape is like this. So this, this is an O10 phase. These are 111 type phases, and these are 110 type phases. Okay. So can somebody tell me what kind of symmetry 
Can you find any symmetry elements for that shape? Is there any rotation axis? Hmm? Dyad. Where, where? You can say, yeah, n uh, normal to zero, one, zero, right? So there's a twofold axis going that way. Uh, I've got a, a movie. Um, well, it's on my website. I won't play a movie here. Um, there's a twofold axis going that way. Anything else? Hmm? No, because look, this is different from this. Yeah? It looks like a square, doesn't it? Yeah. Anything else? Um, not a mirror. Yes, you are right. Mirror. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the mirror plane. The twofold axis is going that way, and this time the mirror plane is at ninety degrees to that axis, and therefore we write two over m. Okay. Yeah. So well done. Okay. Yeah. So the point group symmetry of this object is two upon m. Has anybody printed out my notes for this course? Lecture notes, not the slides. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So. So we know that this is uh, this has a point group symmetry of two upon m. So if you look at uh, page nine when you print them out, right? Um, there's a list of the point group symmetries. of the different crystal classes. Yeah, sorry, page 18, okay? So we have the crystal classes listed here, and we have the elements that you can find, point group elements, for each of those crystal classes. And if I look at 2 upon m, then that has to be monoclinic. There's no other system with a point group symmetry of 2 upon m. So just by looking at that equilibrium shape, you can say that's a monoclinic crystal. Okay. That's quite easy to do. So you're walking about in the field and you pick up a crystal, you work out its point group symmetry, and you remember your table on page 18 you can say this is a monoclinic crystal. How impressive will your friends be? Yeah? Uh, this is uh, another crystal uh, which is called epsomite. Now, this is a very misleading diagram because the angle here is not 90 degrees, okay? It's about 88 degrees. So don't think of this as a 90 degree angle and find me some symmetry elements. Yeah, yeah, what, what is it? Yeah, well, what is it? What, what's axis or? No, you see this angle is not 90 degrees. That's why I've, I've drawn this 3D diagram like this. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, there's a rotation axis. What kind? Uh, Rot rotation, is it dyad or triad or dyad, yeah? So there's a two-fold rotation axis vertically. Any others?
I don't know whose this is, but uh, I'm going to drink it, okay? <laughs> so. Right, now this is difficult, yeah? Because this angle is not 90 degrees, so it can't be an axis passing normal to this face or this face, but it's actually passing through this edge horizontally and through the other edge horizontally. So we get a point group symmetry which is 2 to 2. That means along the x-axis we have a twofold, along the y-axis we have twofold, and along the z-axis we have twofold. So for this you need a movie, all right? Go away. What is this? What does this say? How can I make this go away? What does this say? So you are Korean. What does this say? <laughs> Should I press this button or not? Well done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try again. Okay, not to worry. Look, um, so we are rotating by an axis which is normal to that edge. Yeah? And you can see that we will recover the structure after going through 90 degrees. So that's exactly how we started. This was the original where we had the green color on top. Now we have the green color on the bottom. And you can see the shapes are exactly identical after rotating by 180 degrees about this edge. OK? Yeah, so you can find these movies and you can watch them in your own time to convince yourself that there's twofold axes this way, that way, and that way. OK? Right, so we go back to our point group table. Can you tell me what the crystal structure is? Have a look. Yeah. Orthorhombic, just by looking at it. Yeah? Looking at the equilibrium shape, you can say it's an orthorhombic crystal. Okay, uh, so you've already learned how to write point group notation. Uh, you know, two with a symbol M next to it means that you've got a mirror plane containing a twofold axis. Okay, and two with and two over M means you've got a twofold axis and a mirror plane this way, at 90 degrees to the mirror plane. Okay, so we have two over M and M. There are ambiguous, way, ambiguous ways of writing 2M. So, for example, MM is similar to 2M as is MM2, but we use the minimum that we need to specify the symmetry. Okay? Uh, when you have a fourfold axis, normal to one mirror plane, 
but parallel to two mirror planes. It's 4 over m mm. Yeah? 4 over m mm. But for convenience, we write it as simply that, right? But it means that the four-fold axis is normal to one of the mirror planes. And when we're looking at an object, the first symbol will be the symmetry, which is parallel to the z-axis. And then we look at the x and the y-axis. Okay? So this is the table that we were looking at. When you have a point group symmetry, which is 2 upon m, it's got to be monoclinic. And when we have 2 to 2, it's got to be orthorhombic. Okay? Now, I said to you that we look at the symmetry first parallel to the z-axis, then the x and the y-axis. Right? But there is one exception. Uh, in the case of the cubic system, the defining symmetry is four triads. And those triads are really important. So in the case of the cubic system, we look along z, which is a four-fold axis. Yeah. But the second one refers to the triad. And the third one is uh, along the x or y axis. Okay? But otherwise, these symbols are very, very simple. Uh, the bar on there implies that there is also an inversion. So you rotate by... Uh, 120 degrees, and then you invert through the center. So I don't want you to worry too much about this. Uh, this will become very, very easy as we go along in the course, and you have a table given to you. Right? It's a convention about the notation that first you look at the symmetry along the z-axis, then x and y, and then you write your point group symbol. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Yeah, here you are. Okay. Now, um, changing the subject. Uh, there is a law called the Weiss zone law. So, supposing that U, V, W represent the indices of a direction. And remember that direction is a vector in real space, and U, V, W are the components of that vector with respect to your unit cell. And HKL are similarly the indices of a plane. If the direction lies in that plane, then this equation will be equal to zero. <coughs> now, in the cubic system, that's very easy to prove that if a direction lies in a plane and you take the dot product between the plane normal and the direction, that comes to zero. But doing dot products is dangerous when you're not in the cubic system. Right? However, this Weiss zone rule is completely general. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with triclinic, monoclinic, etc. If a direction with indices U, V, W lies in a plane H, K, L, then, and the sum is zero, then the sum will be zero. Okay? Uh, I haven't proven this to you. I will prove this to you in 30 seconds when we've done the reciprocal lattice. Okay? It's very, very easy once we've done that. Now, this is a, a cube, and this is the 1, 1, 0 plane, and this is the 1, 1, 0 direction. Now, the 1, 1, 0 direction in a cube is normal to the 1, 1, 0 plane. That is not the case when we deviate from the cube. So, this is an uh, orthorhombic cell. This is the 1, 1, 0 plane. And you can see that is not at 90 degrees to the 110 plane. Okay? So when the indices are the same, 110 plane, 110 direction, it doesn't mean that the 110 direction is at 90 degrees to the plane if it's not cubic. Okay? So we will deal with that uh, later. Okay, that's the end of today's lecture, and I'll see you.